I do believe it's March 23rd. We've already done the Ides of March and all the official stuff, including a full moon last night, which we couldn't see because it was cloudy at my house. Little snow on the ground and people are using their usual expletives when it snows in March. <laughs> But today we are at the Press Republican. In case there's any question in anybody's mind who's watching this program, with Lois Claremont, Lois, Hello. the editor, and my dear friend Joe Lowe, Joe Lowe Templio. Forty. Good. Uh, how many years? Thirty years here for me. No, that's impossible. Yeah, Forty for me. Yeah, but you both started when you were six or seven. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but you know why we're here today? Because. We want to talk about the prison break. And as I was driving down here, I said to myself, we all have significant times in our life that go ding, ding when you come to that date. And for me, many more of those than for you or for Calvin, starting way, way back, you know, in the 1930s and early 1940s. But the prison break is indelible. Mm -hmm. on our ca the calendars of history for us. And we go back to June 6th and 7th and 8th of 2015. Mm -hmm. Where were you both when you heard about it? Can I, you remember? I was at home and in bed and uh, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I got she admits a, it too. Yeah. I got a call from Captain LaFountain. It was early in the morning and he said, you know, we got something that we need to get out to the public and said that two uh, prisoners had escaped from Clinton Correctional, and I, I was dumbfounded. I mean, Clinton Correctional, they escaped, and I thought, were they being transported somewhere or something? And he said, no, they, they broke out, and I, I couldn't believe it. Shocking. And you, and you, Joseph? Well, shortly after that, she texted me. And oh. said, <laughs> of course. We got, get going. We got work to do. <laughs> that uh, was the right-hand man. Early already. Saturday morning. It was a yeah. beautiful day, nice yeah. sunny day. Uh, never expected it in a million years. Yeah, normally on Saturday we have just one reporter working and one editor so, and one photographer. It's a small staff on Saturdays and Sundays. So we called everybody in. Joe was the first one to get on it and the whole staff turned out for it. And, and, and they didn't stop working for 23, 23 days. days. A long, long time. And I was just doing my morning constitutional jogging at a very slow rate of speed on the main street of Morrisonville with my little cell phone in my pocket and it was ringity dingity ringity dingity and that's and boy did that just set the wheels in motion didn't it oh it did big well, time out of newspaper as you can imagine thank god i wasn't on the radio anymore at that time and calvin and i do some timely things but they're not driven by that clock on a given day so then, yes, all hell did break loose. Yes, it did. In a manner of speaking. Yeah, I mean, when you when a big story like that unfolds, I mean, you're in this business. Your instincts tell you right away, oh, this is a big one. You, you know, you better get on it and extra focus. And we had that feeling definitely that day. This we was something special. We all have pumped, I don't know how many tens of thousands of gallons of adrenaline in our lifetimes. Right. Absolutely. Be being junkies in this oh, business. Yeah. Yeah. in this business and even for me in the backgrounds watching you work was an incredible experience for that time. Well you get excited for something like this but I mean it's very serious and scary Yes. And especially when more and more time went by and they weren't captured but yeah. it you know it just changed everybody's lives around here. And, and I hope none of us had anything really serious to accomplish outside of our businesses or our news interests for the next 23 well, days. Joe, it didn't missed, get done. Joe missed some big things. His daughter's graduation he went to, and that <laughs> turned out to be interesting. You had missed a couple things before then. I think uh, your daughter, your other daughter, or was it her, was yeah, in uh, a competition. In there was a few things, yeah. uh, but you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, right. We, we, you know, I made it to graduation. He did make oh, it to did. graduation. You know, it's hard to have regrets. And, you know, <laughs> Calvin has carried that camera on his shoulder since the early 1980s, covered thousands and thousands of events. Mm -hmm. And there are personal, private things that you wish you could have attended. Uh, thank God on the radio, I didn't have to miss too many ball games with my kids, you know, with so many kids playing. But you have to do your thing. Yeah. And, I don't know if it was self-instilled or, or if just we felt an obligation that we had to know. And that's where 
this wonderful organ called the Plattsburgh Press Republican, which has been around in one form or another since, I think, 1811, if my history lesson comes back. So you knew that you had to do it. Yeah, and we knew it was a big story, and we knew we had to cover it very thoroughly. And an important part of it was the safety of the public and letting them know what was going on and keeping them up on every all 24 hours about what was happening. So. This was the first story I remember where social media was very important. Twitter, for example, we reported a lot on Twitter, so people had instant information. And it, I always tell people this, when they broke out of prison, I had 340 followers or something on Twitter. Within a week, I had 2,800. <laughs> I mean, this story had huge interest everywhere, and it. Twitter was a very good and fast way to follow it. Yeah, the uh, the entire three three weeks, I think every single story I did was on my phone in the field. Yeah, uh, never would have done that twenty years ago. No, you know we're we're speaking one day, twenty four hours after a horrible terrorist attack in Brussels, Belgium. And how many reporters did you see doing interviews on their phones? They had mm -hmm. very little communication. They, they had a hard time getting a Wi-Fi signal or a telephone signal. And so many of the reporters, you know, their, their reports were lost in the ethers before they could finish. But imagine how communication has changed since my interest first started in, in uh, radio and television just in those mm -hmm. few years since the 1960s. And sure. since you both... Yep. Right I remember off. having to come back from something and type a story on a typewriter and then give it to somebody else and it got transferred onto this tape and there was a whole process. Now, <laughs> you, you know, you, you take your phone and it, it's instantly online. Isn't it amazing? And, and our, our dear friend Jack LaDuke, who's been a bosom buddy of mine for the last mm -hmm. 50 or 60 years, watch, watching him do film. Uh -huh. and race to the Clinton County <laughs> Airport yeah. and race to get it on an aircraft and ra have somebody race on the other end to bring that film over and then try to get it edited. Yeah. When they say film at 11, sometimes they barely made it. It's instant, uh, so. instant information all the time right now. And um, it's both good and bad, I guess. Um, but that for that story, that really worked out well for us because we, we were able to get timely information out there right away, which was, uh, you know, big for the safety factor, too. Right. Long before the days when the Internet was invented and the digital age was far into the distant future, how do you think I did most of the research I had to do for historical things? Newspaper archives. Mm -hmm. As a mm -hmm. small child, I became a monstrous fan of the New York Times, Always interested in history and studying about the Civil War from the front page of the New York Times. And boy, did you guys pick up some readers during those 23 oh, I guess we did. days. Oh, yeah. There was, um, I heard from people literally all over the world um, uh, Africa, Europe, Australia. Um, this was worldwide for sure. We have a big uh, display board in our newsroom that shows where people are reading from and you can look at it at any time and see how many people are on our website and the numbers shot up and they were right from everywhere. This oh. had international interest definitely. You don't want to wish bad luck on the world and certainly we would be devastated if we had another prison break. But what it does, besides helping us pump that adrenaline for, for readership of newspapers, Mm -hmm. And what, did you know anybody anywhere in this country or elsewhere in the world who didn't know where Clinton Correctional Facility and Caddyville and Katyville <laughs> yeah, right. were all those? It put, it put this place on the map in ways that we could only imagine before. Right. People had kind of a distorted view, though, sometimes. Like, I did something like 30-something radio interviews during the um, prison break, and like they would call from Detroit or wherever and they they'd say things like so what do you normally report on up there like a cow that got out of the pasture or something you know it was kind of insulting they thought we were just they laughed but we, we we've made some some cows and some moose and yeah, okay. various various other things like a peacock they're, they're, <laughs> pretty they're pretty not a few like that but you know i i reminded them that you know we have problems too. We report on heroin overdoses and use and, you know, the, a lot of topical things that they have going on in their area too. And, you know, so 
I tried to educate people a little when I was talking with them about our area and how beautiful it is and, you know, the closeness to the Canadian border. People didn't understand come and, that. Come and spend a couple of weeks this summer, buy a boat, spend right. money, buy some <laughs> gas. Well, here we are, and it's important to not only to chronicle those things for those 23 days in your paper, but to uh, make another indelible mark on history by putting in the book form. Mm -hmm. Was that was that uh, something you decided on very early? Because we're going to sit down and talk about it in a minute. Yeah, okay. Did you just decided? I think, I think we did toward the end of the time say, boy, we should put this in a book. Yeah, we, well, we had the idea from the ice storm. Right, uh, we did we, one then. That's another one yeah. of those but, moments yeah. where were you when, yeah. you know? Right. right. So it would seem natural to, uh, to yeah. follow suit and do the same thing. And we've done them for like the bicentennial of Plattsburgh, and we had another one, um, North Country Century, you know, for the millennium. But the ice storm was the one we thought, and that one, people, you know, it's a part of our history here, and it needs to be recorded somewhere, and people had such high interest in it and wanted something that, you know, they can't save a stack of newspapers like that forever. You, you know, know how so. many people do? Yeah, <laughs> right. You want to know how many newspapers myself, there are but... in my house, in my garage right now? Yeah. Don't tell and the many, Calvin, <laughs> Calvin and I had a mutual friend who collected old newspapers. And he thought it was necessary to supply Calvin and I with these old newspapers every now and again. I only I, have one. Come on. <laughs> yep, I have one. Guess which one it was. I don't know. When the day Nixon resigned. Come on. Uh, Banner headline, Nixon yeah. resigns. I kept it when I was a kid. Really? <laughs> I, have, I have more than that. I have plenty well, of them. Well, you know, you're looking at a guy behind the camera, which the camera can't see, but I can quite often who is a collector of paper products celebrating various, uh, you know, times in our history from old magazines and newspapers. And between his archives and my archives, I don't know if we, we rival the public library. The only thing I don't have is, micro, <laughs> is microfiche, because I got the whole thing. But I have another interesting story about newspaper headlines, if you'll bear with me. I bear with you. When I was 15... Joke. In 1977, I had a paper route at Rochester General Hospital. Me and my buddy, we would go and sell newspapers in all the patient rooms. You know, patients would buy the papers. And we also had the box in the lobby for the paper machine, you know, the machine. Mm -hmm. And the only day we ever sold out of papers was the day Elvis died, or the day after Elvis really? died. Really? Yep. Really? You're kidding yep, me. That's, everybody wanted that paper and huh. that headline. And it dawned on me the other day. That's interesting. I yeah. bet a lot of people still have it, too. You, you caused me to digress. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> as if I couldn't do that on my own. <laughs> I have a complete, call it a portfolio or a big roll, if you will, of the original teletype news stories of the day Elvis died. Because oh, yeah. I interviewed, I got to interview people in in. Great Britain. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. People were into I that. I have all those original teletype stories. Huh. We're going to pause for just a moment, <laughs> even though we could stand here until next Tuesday and then go for another week without stopping. And we'll continue our program about the prison break. None of us in this room relish bad news, but it's been the basis of our employment for a long, long time. And when I, when I referred to all of us, I started with myself by saying I'm a news junkie. Mm -hmm. And even now that I'm separated from the mainstream, if you will, I'm still interested. So we talked about the Brussels attack from yesterday. I had many things I could have done around my house, inside and outside. What did I do? I was glued to the television set all day long. Mm -hmm. How can you not be? Because it, I guess it's part of our genetic yeah. well, makeup, isn't it? After we do it for so many years, you know, it's in your blood. I'm always interested in what's going on. Can Everywhere, you imagine local, doing anything national. else for a living, though, Lois? Oh, God, no. No. You know, through good times and bad, and we're going to talk mostly about good times and about the people who are still dyed-in-the-wool fans of the newspaper. And I don't, yes... I've been thrust into the digital age, and yes, I do have to use use a computer and, a, and an iPhone every day and so on, but I would be lost if I couldn't trudge out to my little newspaper tube and bring and carry in, you know, in snow and rain and all the other things that 
mailmen do, carry my newspaper in and unfold it on the table and read it with my cereal. We love people like you. <laughs> well, We're like I, that too. And I love people like you, and that's yeah. why we've become such good friends over the years. The other reason is that we appreciate each other. Mm -hmm. For, for, for reasons that our, our viewers today can only imagine. We kept an eye on your Facebook during the oh whole thing goodness. to see what was... I, were, I did. And, way, and some other Facebooks too. Way so. too many hours. But it was important because we all have... Because we've been around here for such a long time, we have contacts that the average news person in another medium or a young person who moved here from Oshkosh to become a television reporter and has trouble with the pronunciation of the word Katieville, yeah. I can only imagine, and they wish they had, you know, I refer to the Rolodex in my mind, but I had a real one when I was at the radio station with thousands of names I had collected for over 50 years, mm -hmm. so that when there was an earthquake centered in Chamity, Quebec, I knew exactly who right. to call and saying, what is it, register? Right, right. So, you know. The, the local contacts were the difference in why we were able to report things that the national media who came in, and I mean, there were people here from New York Times and CNN and CBS, all the networks were here, and but they didn't know where to go or who to talk with, and we had all the ins. Joe yeah, has. Extremely it. valuable, uh, those mm -hmm. contacts. I, I tell the story uh, before, um, sp you know, speaking of Twitter, I mean, when you got information, you would, you would tweet it. And I got to the point where I wanted to be a little careful because if I had something nobody else did, which I did a lot because we didn't knew right. everybody, um, I would question myself, should I tweet this? Because a couple times I would put something on Twitter out in the field and all the media would come running over. It's like putting food in a fishbowl. They all come swimming up. <laughs> so well, he'd to be get somewhere it. on I'd, a back road in Saranac or something talking to some people and he'd tweet, you know, so-and-so said they heard the disturbance in the backyard or uh, police were tramping through their backyard last night. Yeah. And all of a sudden, everybody would show up from all this different media. What's going on? What's going on? You the, know? The, the, the best example of that was, I think it was the first Friday, um, there was a sighting of two men jumping over a stone wall in the oh, woods. Oh, on well, we remember Kringle right. Road. And the names of the yep. people involved. On Kring <laughs> Kringle Road, right yeah, off Route 3. Now, I know all the Kringles. Well, they all played soccer for my oh, wife. Of and we've um, known them for Saranackers for years. So I was at the corner at Chris Kringle's house, and he has a deep lot in the back of the woods that goes way back. And that's right where they were searching. And he's like, come on, I'll bring you back there. So we, me and uh, I think it was Gabe, our photographer mm -hmm. at the time, um, went deep into the woods. And we could see right where the, the search was going on. And, and I happened to be on the, on the phone with Geraldo Rivera and his radio show. <laughs> and he's like, don't get shot now. <laughs> I'm like, no, don't worry. But I, was, I, st I started thinking. You know, I'm in the woods here. The cops are here. These, these murderers could be behind that next tree. Uh, better right. be careful. Um, we wound up doing a town video were. from those woods. Yeah, you did. That was another thing, you know, before video was what TV people did and you do now. But it wasn't a newspaper thing. But, you know, in the past couple of years, we do video, too, and can post them online just instantly. So with with his camera, Joe's out shooting video and the photographer's helping. <laughs> and he's doing a, t a report like a TV reporter out there. You know, I'm standing here and the searchers are behind me in the woods and, and we're able to instantly put it online. But it was that connection with the Kringles and yep. the Saranac family that helped, helped me get the, right. in, that in there. And that's invaluable. Yep. But and it was so intense. Sure I mean, was. it defined the word intense in your field and every other field uh, for 23 days. To the point where I wrote several letters to Stephen King saying, you gotta do another Shawshank Redemption and I'll give you the title of it, 23 days. <coughs> and of course he never, he not only didn't read it, but didn't respond because he couldn't care less about anything that happened. I bet he Dan heard th about this that was going on. Everybody seemed to know about it. I did. So how did the, What's the genesis of the book now? Explain to me what happened from the beginning. Well, we, we toward the end of it, we thought, you know, we should try to put this in some kind of a book. But, you know, it took a while after it was over. And then we had written for 23 days. This is 
this is probably half of what we wrote, yeah. but there's we had to figure out what to leave out. That was the biggest difficulty always, in putting the book problem. together. Yeah, always a problem. Because each day we did, we filled page one and did a special report on page three. So we had numerous stories every day and had to figure out what to put in here. And, you know, we wanted each day represented. I think there was only one day that was fairly quiet in the whole thing. And that was when everything went downstate because somebody down there saw two people walking <laughs> yeah. by a track. Oh, believe me. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. And I everybody mean, I, took off for there. I loved it. I loved the part where everybody had an opinion. No matter who they were, whether they were seven years old or 106, oh yeah, I know they've, they've left the area. Oh, where yeah. is Poughkeepsie by now? You know, <laughs> everybody was sure they left except the police. And they told us consistently through it, we have no evidence that they have left our area. No stolen car that's missing anywhere, no, uh, just no, sightings that seem very credible even that one they were unsure of they said we're we have no reason to think they've left the area and they turned out to be right and and we may not get to it and i don't know if there'll ever be an addendum to this book maybe i don't hope for that sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for but i still have this gnawing feeling down inside that there are at least three chapters to this story that are unwritten Oh, and I yeah. know you feel the same way. And it, it'll go on like that forever. Uh, I mean, there's always going to be mysteries uh, um, surrounding this. Um, like the Hugh Heron Road. I never knew until the Major came in and told us they walked right down the Hugh Heron Road, in, right in the middle of town. Stuff like that is going to be cropping up. And, and, and the, the report, time. we're all waiting for the state report, so that's going to bring a lot more information into it. But no, even that we're really waiting happen. for the state <laughs> report. Is that the understatement of the yeah. century? Well, yeah. it, what, another interesting thing about this is um, not only the escape and the manhunt, but through it all, we learned a lot about the inside workings of that prison and all state prisons. And I, you both had been inside there before yes. more than mm-hmm. once. Right. And of course, I'd been in there many times in the past in days when it was far different to be taken inside than it is now. And so many stories, a lot of them good, positive, solid stories. Mm-hmm. And then to, to, to rehash and relive all of that once again and to learn something when you thought you knew all there was to know. Right. And one of the few places I had never visited in all my years was that place where the honor block was located. Yeah. I had never been there. And there might be a good reason why I wasn't taken there. You right. Know? I don't think any of us had seen it before. It might be fairly new. I don't know how long, or lo- how long it had been around, but I think it had changed, too, from it, the yes. way it was at the beginning and evolved into, you know, more freedoms and, and but definitely. But local personalities, because how many of our friends and neighbors, including a lot of the members of my immediate family, have made their living by right. working behind the, mm-hmm. those walls and the walls of, and fences of other prisons here in the North Country. So you think you know things. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of people giving you little tidbits of information that you couldn't use or couldn't substantiate over the years. So mm-hmm. it was a li- difficult for those 23 days to know what to go with on that given yeah. day. And as the editor of this here publication, th- did you feel the, the heaviness on your on your shoulders? Yeah, there were, I mean, for all of us, there were pressures on us to report things that once in a while somebody not very often, but once in a while, somebody would get something that we didn't have, and there would be pressure to to report what the others were reporting. But we were, I think, we earned some respect by being cautious and accurate. We made sure we knew something for for, for sure have before you heard we that tweeted on television it. networks over the years. Mm. Cautious but accurate, yeah. confirm things. Uh, you the, know, substantiate you know, a story. There was a couple from networks, three sources, yeah. a couple cable networks that right. were pretty loose with. Some of their information. Oh yeah, and, and you and look t- back at some of the things they reported. Are, that, and still are. Yeah. And there are more unscrupulous publications, newspapers, large and small. And websites. And we're not going to. Yeah. And websites, dear God, please. Yeah. But there, are, there are aspects of this whole thing which we can't get into the philosophy of newspapers, and and what's happened just since the years you people have been involved. 
but I've been associated indirectly with a lot of hometown newspapers. And there are quite a few people I know in your roles, respective roles, who would have said, I did enough today, I'm going home. Yeah. I'm not going to sleep at this place again tonight. <laughs> we we were working. I mean, we were up early in the morning. Days, some right? days. Because yeah. one thing we had to do, we had to always have a current story online in case they were captured. Because say they get captured at 5 in the morning, we can't wait. It takes a few minutes for a story to appear online. So we always had to have something new that was there in case they got captured so we could quickly change the headline to, you know, the capture and yeah. that, that we were posting things all around the clock. They were out there at all times, all the reporters, and they were sending pictures in and texting at, me at home. And I would put things yep. up online from home. We worked from home part, uh, during the night. Yeah, I remember it was that day that when they found uh, DNA in Franklin County. Mm -hmm. uh, the next day it was Sunday. It was Father's Day. And uh, we were home. We had a nice Father's Day meal with my girls. And she calls at 7.30. It's like, you got to get over to Franklin County. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, okay. We, and that it was, was pouring rain that night. It was <laughs> not what terrible. I remember. And it was about, it was after midnight. I was talking to her. And she's like, get a hotel in Malone. I'm like, ah, it's only 45 minutes from my house. I'm going to go home. But then at 5 o'clock the next day, I was back yep. there. So And we sent Joe up from here and Denise <clears throat> over from her home. And Denise Ramo, she played a big role in this too, because all of a sudden we found out we had to be in Owl's Head, and that was yeah. when everybody was down near the border yep. of Pennsylvania after that sighting down there, and we got a great tip that DNA had been confirmed up this way, and we knew we had to go to Owl's Head. Changed everything. Yep, changed everything. And we and I told them both, I said, don't tweet till you get there, till you get to <laughs> Owl's Head, because we needed a big head start on everybody, and they got up there, and Denise, I remember called me and said, there's huge searchlights set up along the road here. It's very dramatic. And I said, start tweeting now. And, and all of a sudden, it was so interesting on CNN where they were running this reel over and over of this woman who had seen the two guys walking by the railroad track. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing this little scroll, you know, something happening in upstate New York and all this. And pretty soon, they're all hightailing well, it, it back was, up. It was amazing that first night that when I went up there in the pouring rain, uh, the the dirt road that led to the camp in Mountain View. Um, I was driving behind two Humvees, uh, law enforcement Humvees, and I tucked in behind them, and they opened the roadblock and they let us all right through. They must have thought I was with them, and I got through there. Close enough. Yeah, and I'm driving back in there, pretty deep, and the road's getting muddy and it's like not good. I'm like I'm gonna get stuck, so I, I pull over to the side, and there's a truck there. And I roll the window down, and it's Sheriff Dave Favreau oh and, and, and um, Under Sheriff uh, Maggie. And he's like, what are you doing here? How'd you get back here? <laughs> I, love it. I said, I just drove in. He's like, you better get out of here. He says, they could come out of the woods any second now. And I said, uh, I said okay. He said, like, he said, I'm heading out. Get behind me and, and head out. But that was the first day of uh, the Franklin County portion of the search. Right. So... I don't know how you would all sit down and knock your heads together and say, here's how we're going to lay this book out. Because every time you guys open your mouth today, you fill my mind with things that I knew at the time. In my personal interviews with guys like Dave Favreau, which will never be in the media, as we'll never live long enough, even with my last day on earth, to put all, the, all these conversations that we had privately with these people mm -hmm. because the interaction between agencies on so many levels involved in something like this Calvin and I talked about it many times how did they not I don't want to say how did they not shoot each other in the woods but I mean communications among among all the agencies was an amazing thing to, to listen to and watch as we all tried oh, to yeah. pick up their private conversations on scanners and so on I think Major Guess did an amazing job coordinating the whole search up here. Especially in retrospect. Oh, Even yeah. Even yes. it seemed like chaos on some days, you right. say, my God, and here we are. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure he felt pressure f as time went on. I know they all did because, you know, it kept going and going and there was no resolution. And people kept, people who don't know the area kept saying, how could you not find these guys oh, with, sure. with yeah. 1,500 officers? Yeah. But I, you know, I'm just thinking back to his letter to the 
his letter in the paper today in answer to mm -hmm. a letter to the editor. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. You imagine the pressure on it. No. No, no. you don't, really. No. So that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Somebody who's watching this far in advance of when we're doing this on the 23rd of March, I'll have to go and get that newspaper, yeah. won't they? But this day 16, when we went to Mountain View, and that's one of the pictures from that night, oh and that was a turning point, because that was when we knew they were still in the area. That was the first time there was evidence that they were definitely in our area. God. And from then on, it, well, it took another week or so. Yeah, but. And with kids of mine who, who live in a summer residence in Owl's Head and troopers are saying, uh, how many shotguns do you have? Three. Keep them loaded. Keep them in the car. Shoot first and ask questions oh, later. There was a lot I mean, of that yeah. feeling so, around. So, you know, we, we, can, we can find some humor in that in retrospect. But nobody did get hurt. There wasn't supposed to be hurt in this whole process. Incredible. Except for friends of mine who were involved in the police agencies that wandered through the woods and got soaking wet. And, yeah. And as oh, my they mother went. would say, caused their death of pneumonia and conditions that were far less than optimum. They, they went through hell out in the woods searching all of them. Yeah. And they, they never stopped. I mean, we talk about the time we put in. It was nothing compared to what any of the searchers did. I mean... Yeah. It doesn't compare at all. But an interesting thing about this story is that it, we told it a lot through the people's per perspective. And should. You know, and not should. just the That's what a public, yeah, is right. All about. Not just the, what the officers were saying, but we talked to so many people during that time who lived in different places and how they were feeling and what they were going through and and their their advice on, you know, what to look for in the woods and what it was like to be out there. And they we we just the people were very big part of this story yeah and it became you know it was for lack of a better word it was an event you know yeah. every day the media was out there the public was out there mm -hmm. and everybody knew what was going on and i think it made them more ready and willing to speak to us and tell their stories yeah but you know it proved to me just by what you've been saying here today and what i remember from this whole thing and calvin too that we do live in a pretty gosh darn good part of the country not only is it beautiful but it's rough and rugged as you know but people want to help each other oh my god they in, were in time of stress i mean i'm thinking of a recent fire near me where money thousands of dollars were raised within a within mm -hmm. a few days and if a kitten gets lost they we tr we tr go crazy trying to find the owner of that kiss right. kitten within you know, you don't find that in metropolitan areas. No, they definitely people. The way people turned out to support all these people, it's just that, it's that's so whole, impressive. I'm sure you wrote about that in the book. I mean, people yeah. were bringing tents and tarps and mm -hmm. and coolers of <laughs> cool beverages. I was on um, uh, by the Trudeau Road on Route Three, and uh, I didn't know John Saint Germain lived there. <laughs> oh, you didn't. So I had to go to the bathroom. So he, he let me in his house, and his wife. Made me a sandwich, gave me something to drink. It's like it was wonderful. <laughs> you know, I've had kids that work for 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 DOT or in the highway departments, and they'll be digging a ditch in front of a house, and the woman's bringing a, a pitcher of cold lemonade and yeah. and some tuna fish sandwiches for lunch. And so right. no, you're not going to find that in uh, no, it's various great. parts yeah. of the Bronx or yeah. Brooklyn. I guarantee you yeah. that. So yeah. okay, where did it start? I mean, how do you know? <laughs> Did it start on the first day? Did you? you know, do, is it all chronological? We did decide to do it that way, and it was it was the best way to organize it. You know, we could have just, uh, you know, we tr we talked about some other ways to do it, but then we thought, no, you know, this was a story of 23 days that were that changed this area, and I said, let's go through it day by day, and we just picked out our best stories of the day or the ones that summed it up the best. Like I said, it was tough to figure out what to leave out, and Nate O'Valley was. And Suzanne Moore, our features editor and our news editor, were very instrumental, too, in helping to pick out what went in here and pick the pictures. We had so many other pictures, too, that we could go through. But, yeah. you know, we just went through day by day and picked the top news of the story. There's Joe well, being... Hold it right up so Calvin <laughs> can see it. Joe being interviewed. 
<laughs> what page is that? He'll find it. 77. Page 77. <laughs> Joe did so many interviews. He was on <laughs> Anderson <laughs> Cooper. Oh, I know all it. about it. Yeah, I'm his biggest fan. Fox, yeah. CNN. Her, I was on Geraldo's radio show about 10 times. Yep. He was the uh, TV guy. I did a lot of radio. You did some radio. Yep. I think we were the media Every day. Reps. Yeah. Every day somebody wanted to talk. You know, at one point I actually had to say, no more interviews today. We aren't getting enough work done we because work, right? they they were calling. They'd want you on the phone every you know. Can you get one station after another? Canada, a bunch of stations in Canada this is wanted a subtext. it. Subtext. Yeah, uh, and it wasn't j just you people involved. Everybody in the media because there oh, yeah. there are some people who really, for the want of a better phrase, get off on the publicity that they're garnering for themselves. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you work for a newspaper and you want people to love that newspaper, especially your hard work during this time. You weren't looking for any, any personal acclaim. But I know people in the community, and that's a sub subtext, and I won't name any names, who their whole lives depended on this is their, my 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. There were people who abandoned some tremendous responsibilities in their communities in their respective jobs by you know buying coffee and donuts for the for the television news reporters that were in town mm. you know right. you all knew when they went home you were still going to be coming in yeah. early the next morning to get a newspaper out. that's right and we did remind a couple people around our area that those people would all disappear and that we would always be here and still covering the story. And we will be for a long time. You know, this, says, gonna... this says... I a, know what you're thinking. <laughs> but it says a lot for the plight of the hometown newspaper. And you and I have talked privately about it so many times. And I care about the people that I like who work very hard in times where it's difficult to keep a newspaper going every single day to oh, keep yeah. the staff that you know you'd love. Well, ah. you got to remember... It's a profession, and we're professionals, and you have a job to do. And I give her all the credit in the world. For three weeks, she ran this ship uh, perfectly, and did. A, and without that leadership, I don't think this happens. Oh, it, you know, because after a while, you wallow. After uh, several days of saying, "I can't do it. I don't have any hair left to pull out." What the heck do we do next? Yeah, it was it was interesting, and and we had to rotate people and try to get them a day off. I mean, I I don't know how many days you worked first till you got one day off. I think in twenty three days I had one total day off. I think but graduation day was the yeah, first. Yeah, that was the only one. <laughs> and Joe and Denise and Kim uh, Dedham in uh, the Tri Lakes area, which was interesting. She was in the Tri Lakes. She lives in Elizabethtown, but she was a big help during the story because. What she would well, do is yeah. is call people by phone using a reverse directory. Like we'd tell her the search is on such and such road, and she'd get on trying to find the reverse phone numbers, you know, so that she could call people. And she was doing phone interviews, which was good because we couldn't be everywhere at once. Joe was out in the field a lot. Kim did a lot f by phone from where she was, which was great. That we needed that. It made it, it made it seem like there was a cast of thousands. It did. Where if you had 12 on a given day, you were pretty plus. Right. And Denise, same thing. She was up in Franklin County, but, and we wow. all, we had somebody up there every day. Yeah. But, but you weren't allowed certain places. Like sometimes she wanted to get down a certain road and they weren't letting, letting anybody down there. So then we had to use phones and, and do you know somebody who lives on this road or do you know somebody who knows somebody who lives on the road and tracking people down. And it certainly helped that you were part of a highly respected institution in the community. So when you're talking with a guy like Dave Favreau, he says, Joe, my God, get out of here. You know, or where do you want to go? Just come with me, I'll get you inside. Yes, yes. It puts me in mind of all those days when I was on the radio and mm -hmm. I'd go to the scene of a fire and the fire chief would say, come on, Gordy, I'll show you where it started, where today you wouldn't get anywhere near the yellow tape around the, the building. Right. So having those contacts. Yeah being respected in the community for what you do, and to have those people who are in high places uh, respect you enough to know that you're not gonna... You're gonna, gonna be, get it right. You're gonna get yep. it right. Yeah. Right. That, in uh, retrospect, it's gotta be a feel-good thing for all of you, for both of you and for the rest of your staff. And by the way, I wanna mention the publisher who just retired. Right. 
Bob Parks. Bob Parks. He was very supportive through the whole thing. And, I mean, he, he there wasn't much he could do. We were, as far as giving us a break, we all, he knew we all had to just keep working. And he was, he was encouraging and supportive and just uh, really. He paid his dues and he got yeah. Irishman of the Year. So <laughs> it was, was all great. right. <laughs> Joining you. For, <laughs> yeah, we were proud of that. So uh, pick, a, pick a page in a story in here that you're especially proud of, both of you. Um, I just wanted to mention, you talked about those connections. Uh, when the search moved to, to Mountain View, Owl's Head, um, the, of course, the bar there, Belly's Tavern, uh -huh. uh, that was that became the hub, the uh -huh. central well, meeting of place, course. kind of. Right. And, and there's I, still stories about it. And I know that yeah. guy. I know Belly because oh, my sure. brother-in-law was very tight with him, and uh, that's where we got a lot of really good information. We did. That, that nobody else did. Yep. And <laughs> Joe, I'll say one thing I'm extremely proud of is Joe has great connections he always has he's a he's got an incredible network he's a he's a friendly guy he knows a lot of people he remembers things he can talk to anybody so he he was the one who came up with some good inside stories that were quoted by the new york times and other places about what had happened in the prison and what goes on in the prison and those they were source stories we couldn't reveal the names on most of them but he had some really good inside information because of his contacts yeah, that's that's the kind of satisfaction that. that you need when you work so hard. Yeah. At the end of the day, you have to say, "Yes, I did this, yeah. and <laughs> nobody else can do this." Well, they those were the stories. They never been to bellies. Yeah, yeah. Right, no, right. But that this yep. is true, and it's absolutely true. And the fact that I had a daughter and son-in-law who live in in Owl's Head in the summertime and had those three shotguns in their truck everywhere they went, I can't even imagine. You know, well, my hue and cry was, get the heck out of there. Really? Come to my house. I got lots of bedrooms in my house. Well, it's yeah. funny because, you know, at the, at the bar there, um, all these national media people were coming in, and they're like, there's no Wi-Fi. And Belly would say, darn right. We we're Wi-Fi free and proud of it. People come to Mountain View to get <laughs> away from all that. Love it. They want to relax in the woods. Saying it? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, these people don't understand that, though, Billy. <laughs> but he was right. It was, you know, yeah. And the be it's a beautiful place, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, and we are so tied to all those communications devices yeah. that have been invented. I was, I, I, without mentioning any names, because everything you say puts me in mind of a story, because my whole life is built on a stack of stories. Oh yeah. But I was talking to a retired law enforcement official at a, at a restaurant last night about an event. A catastrophic event that happened in his life, and it was, we decided it was like 21 years ago, and the fact that I just happened to be reporting it from the street corner across from where it was happening on one of the first, remember the bag cell phones, the thing weighed about 15 yes, pounds, and I'm trying, yeah. to, trying to get back to the radio station and reporting live on something, and I had no business being within 500 yards of that place. But it was significant for both of us, and that's our instant connection when we ran into each other at this restaurant. But how things have changed. So, uh, did you pick a story that you liked the best? Yeah. Um, you, well, it's funny. We've been talking for I don't know how many minutes now, but nobody, does it matter? Nobody's mentioned Joyce Mitchell once. Oh, so, yeah. far. <laughs> so you got, of course. You, we, I haven't mentioned any of the names. That's up to you. Uh, this so story, what page is it? Th that's one of the big. Tell stories. Calvin what page uh, it is. Page forty-one. Okay. Uh, it talks 41. about the um, the changes inside the prison and some of the things that led uh, led up to the escape. With I got I talked to a re recently retired guard uh, Jeff Dumas who went on the record was he happy was to great. go on the record yeah. and gave us a lot of valuable information. That was right. that was uh, one of the best parts of what you did. Yeah, made him a star. Period. He was a regular on CNN after that. <laughs> well, I noticed that. <laughs> And yeah, you know, that, that it's big. interesting that by day three, we were reporting that a prison worker was being questioned in the escape. Page, and, page what? Uh, 13? 13. Okay, page 13, yes. Yeah, be, I mean, we had a name. We had a name even before that. We had a name pretty quickly A local for her. person, indirectly involved. Right. You know? yeah. Where is she from? She's from your neck of the woods, right? <laughs> Moira? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, I know all of those <laughs> things. I knew pretty early, too. <laughs> yeah. 
So well, well, it's a fascinating part of the story, yeah. obviously. And we had yeah. to decide like when to go with her name because the police, you oh, know, yes. starting and you know this, starting with day one when the governor came here, they held a news conference, and from then on, the Department of Corrections did not say one word about it. They still aren't really saying that. They're waiting for the report to come out. They would not release one scrap of information for yeah, us. No. And, no. the, I, I, the you know, the, everything was shut down. They'd hold a news conference. They'd answer questions, but they wouldn't answer much. No. Nothing we your, didn't I already know. I shared your frustration, obviously, because yeah. I wanted to know through you. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Docs was, was pretty much shut down. Right. Uh, everything went through. And the police, police were very careful what they said. Everybody was fairly careful. But... Uh, uh, where did she get the nickname Tilly? You know, I guess I knew that. Do you know? <laughs> I know, yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm you know, you know, I asked that question. I remember asking that question, but either I didn't care or I've forgotten, which is, which but, is possible but boy, in my case. is this story something out of a movie or something? Like, not only do well, they escape from maximum security. Shawshank prison, Redemption. Right? I mean, give Frozen me a Frozen hamburger break. meat. Right. <laughs> well, and then that whole, and the local work, you know, person who you know, helped them get it's out. It's amazing. Kay and I don't like to cook at home much anymore, and we have so many friends who have wonderful restaurants in the area, and we like to go out to eat every once in a while. And you always run into somebody you know at a table, so you're always there for an hour and a half instead of 20 minutes. But what do we talk about? The prison break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the <laughs> nucleus of conversation it's like I said at the beginning of this program, you don't ever forget what you were doing when you heard the story. Mm -hmm. And there, since this story is still unfolding, mm -hmm. I alluded to that a few minutes ago, but it's still unfolding. It's unfolding here as we speak today. Yeah, and do you have regrets about the, about your coverage, about the fact that you didn't get enough sleep in 23 days no, no. to keep a chipmunk Not healthy. that part of it. I mean, we always wished we could have done more. There were, I, I'll tell you one day where we did get something other people didn't get, but it wasn't quite what we wanted, which was the day that um, David Sweat was shot and brought into the hospital. We, we almost called the reporter back that day because nothing was going on and it was getting later. And, and she called and said, you know, Ashley Livingston was up there that lucky day and oh. Rob fell. <laughs> and we almost didn't send Rob because we thought, we'll just have Ashley take pictures. But then I, you know, we just said, let's get him up there and he can come back later if nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden that whole thing was happening. And everybody tried to, the reporters all tried to go to where the shooting was, we knew there's no way they're going to let you on that spot. So we said, he's going to be brought to the hospital, go to Alice Hyde. So those two went to Alice Hyde Hospital and waited, and we got a good shot. In fact, yeah. it's it wasn't perfect shot. It was um, this one on page 91. 91. Our oh. big headline, oh, it's yes, over. Oh, yes, yes, it's over. And um, this is, you can just see a little of his head coming in. If only this one guy had just, like, stepped back <laughs> a little, we could have got a better. You know, it didn't matter but, because it is. But we were we were the only ones at the hospital when they brought yes. him in. We knew he'd have to come in and, by ambulance, and that, that's where he'd go. So. The know, only regret I had is no longer a regret. For months, I was pining. I wanted so bad to talk to Jay <sighs> Cook. Cook. The trooper, uh, sergeant, and what who a, shot him. and what a guy, and what a oh. finally got that interview. Very so that modest. Re that regret guy. is gone. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, I, I wanted to do the same, and you know, since my 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 direct tenure in the news business was way before any of this happened. You know, the my friends who were young troopers are long since retired, so I had no idea. Well, he was, he was very reluctant, and he got, you know, first for, for a long time, they told us he's not cleared to talk because they really waited till the grand jury. Yeah, yeah and they testimony. waited till David Sweat was sentenced, yeah. really, and then they cleared him that he could talk, but he still wouldn't do it. And we called several times and told uh, Major Guess, you know, he's cleared. Can you get him to talk with us? And he said, I've told him it's okay. It's up to him now. But, and... Joe finally got him to... You know, the legal aspects of this case were at times profound and mind-boggling to me because we all know the principles involved in law enforcement from the bottom almost to the mm -hmm. top. And, you know, you, you talk to these certain people, like, like the DA, Andy Wiley, whose father was a close personal friend, watched Andy grow up from the time he was a small child, to have a guy like Andrew Wiley thrust into this role mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's hard enough to do the job on a regular basis and to make decisions that affect people's lives and futures, but to do it on television. Right, and you're, and you're going to get criticized no matter no, what no you matter decide. What. Yeah, but that's he another handled good himself question. very well on TV. I thought he seemed very professional when he talked to national media, which was which was good. But you know, he had some difficult decisions to make about what charges to bring up and what to prosecute. And he's, he's still getting second-guessed on a lot of them, I'm sure. You, you people are much more thick-skinned than I am. I'm one of those individuals that wants to be liked by everybody all the time, and you can't be that way in the media. And whether people wrote letters to the editor or whispered when you walked by on the street... <laughs> Uh, saying what you should have, could have mm -hmm. done, and none of them are professionals, and most of them, their their opinions aren't worth five cents because they've never been in the trenches. One thing people don't realize is you can't just report something when you hear it. You know, you have oh. to get it confirmed. <laughs> and people would, people, the things people say on Facebook that are libelous, oh. I'm just stunned. And during that whole thing, we were watching Facebook, and people were saying things about Joyce Mitchell that proved to be untrue, that she hadn't even been arrested, or even after she was uh, arrested. About all the principles. That everybody, <laughs> yeah. And they just, you know, people think that if you heard something from someone, it's okay to stick it on your Facebook page because it's Facebook. Well, well, think of all the people who see it. That's a product of it. what Facebook is. Right. And But there are some people take take it as, a, as an important medium. Yeah. And for me, it's just, it's just some fun. On a, on a given it's day. It's fun, but it, it, you know, people it's, just need to be a little careful yeah. about what they say because they got to make sure they're sa accurate. Now, t tell me a little bit about how the book is available to the public. I know it's been out since January, hasn't mm -hmm. it? We sold and out the first printing. We did you yep, really? That's not a bad thing. No, we printed a thousand. It was a, it was tough to decide how many to do. You know, the ice storm book that we still talk about is a collector's item. You can't find them. We didn't get enough printed. They all sold out, and you can't get it anymore. The uh, the Century book, which we have right here, oh, that one we still great, have. Oh, book at all. Yeah, talk about we, a classic. I think this one we printed too many because of what had happened with the ice storm, and we still have a load of those. <laughs> uh, Pla Battle of the Centuries, which was about the Bi Plattsburgh Bicentennial. We knew it would be of interest mostly to Plattsburgh, so we did a small printing. But this one, we did 1,000, sold out right away. And we did another thousand. I think we're like 400 into it or so. So oh, really? You can get it at the Press Republican. It's 14.95 plus tax. And you, you can just also stop at the office on Margaret Street here yep, in Plattsburgh. Margaret Street. And you can get it at a lot of different stores around yeah. the area. Yeah, I think this came out right before Christmas because a lot of people got them for Christmas. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, we did that on purpose. Put it out before Christmas because we figured people might want to give them as gifts for someone. But it's something that maybe our our viewers wouldn't wouldn't think about a newspaper putting out a book about something that it did, mm -hmm. but I think it, I think this just adds a dimension for po in terms of posterity because everybody doesn't save their old newspapers like I do, no. or their old National Geographic and Life magazines from 1948 and so yeah. on. And this sort of capsulized it, and it was available to send to people from out of the area who were interested. You know, a lot of people had relatives who were following it, and and they can't send you know. 24 days worth of newspapers out there so we thought they'd have a book that they could send and it's it, part of our history it's oh. like a little history book for our area it's, about of it's very very important some of those headlines should have red dripping from those you know and that's something else that i want to talk about headlines mm -hmm. i'm a headlines fan i mean i grew up with those 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 big banner headlines on the new york times in new york city mm -hmm. and you know those of us who go on on the internet still look for headlines, don't we, on our phones and other devices? Yeah. Did you pick? Did you do the headlines? Did you do that headline? It's over. No, I didn't. And I'll tell you who did is Bob Grady, our former Come editor. Come on. Yeah, he was. He is <laughs> I've one never of, heard of him. He's always. <laughs> <laughs> he's always been one of our best headline writers. He had won. I don't That's know a how knack. Many. Yeah, I know. It is. It is a real knack. And and. We were talking about this because, of course, Matt had already been shot. And we knew that when they got sweat, what were we going to say? We needed something big and something that could sum it up. And we knew it had to be a big size headline, which means you don't have many words to use. That's right. So we were talking about different stuff, and, we, and I called up Bob and said, 
you got to think of something here that sums it all up. And he, it took him no time at all. He said, it's over. That that says it all. Some perfect. people, and it was, like it was you perfect. said, some people yeah. have a knack for headlines. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm sure being in the business, you appreciate good headlines, oh, yeah. no matter where they are, in a magazine article or on the Internet or wherever. When I saw that, I said, yep. Yep. That was perfect. It's, it's just, over. It it's it's like that up. Facebook game that people play. Describe me in one word. In this case, you got two words. That's right. over. <laughs> you don't have much space when you want to put a headline that's that, that's big. People don't understand that. You know, you it has to fit. And we wanted big. We were going for a big size on that. How many people don't pay attention to headlines? I imagine there are people who don't. Uh, I do. <laughs> I look at the headlines. And say, yeah, that's a story I want to read. Yeah. Because you know, there's uh, headlines. Sometimes have to be cute. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have to be very subtle. Right. It's a talent to be able to get a headline that will draw people in. And the headline and the photos are what draw people to a story. So you have to get something catchy there. And some people are better at coming up with that. Well, you know, is there anything else that you want to mention about the book or putting it together before I move on to all my 12,000 other questions? Actually, I have no more. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it, I mean, was, it was interesting by itself to get this done. Right. Uh, I want to I reiterate the fact that this prison break, and that's the title of the, of the book, mm -hmm. uh, the story is not over. No, it's not. I mean, there are ma many people involved in this story, including many of our friends, present and former corrections officers who will hopefully live for a long, long time who have to live in this jail and other jails after that state report right. is issued. And, and I how think much it'll change their lives from then on, we don't know. Yeah, there will be some changes and they might make it harder for the officers. And you gotta remember that most of the people who work in the prisons are, are good. They're very good at their job. They're professional. They do what they're supposed to do. Obviously, some people didn't. And that's what this story is, the ones who let things fall apart a little and the state responsibility in it which was something that came out in a couple years stories the state made some changes because of trying to save money that made it more difficult for the you know we had to dance around those stories for a while yeah but uh, you know it's time for the dancing to come over and for the trophies to be awarded or not awarded mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting be. it's going to be interesting when we sit here five years from now and ten years from now and the anniversaries of this yeah and see how it uh, all unfolded you yeah. know it's something very important and, and once again i want to uh, tip my gordy little hat to kelvin castine behind the cat behind the camera he's covered these kinds of things for posterity for a very long time and in a way that nobody short of the late mike finnegan did with his camera being in every parade and every place uh just chronicling all these things mm -hmm. and i saw a picture of the inside of his little workshop up there on the ridge road in champlain from one of our old tv shows when we interviewed some people that went to the holy land i don't know 16 years ago with vhs tapes from floor to ceiling everywhere and i would leave calvin's house in those days crying saying my God forbid there's a fire. There's no, this stuff hasn't been saved. What are we ever going to do? But now there's a site called hometowncablenetwork.com that's been up and down like, like a yo-yo over the years, but it's now on. And Calvin is desperately trying to get more of the old films on. And I mention that because he recently put on an interview that we did a long time ago with the late Terrence Gilroy from Danamora with all of the stuff that he saved in his house the history of the, of the riots and the and the prison breaks and the fires and the so on. So if people are really interested in the history of the Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora, there are ways to access information, including this wonderful book called Prison Break, which is, is available right at the main offices of the Plattsburgh Press Republican here in town. This Do you have any uh, films from the, the games him, him and I did over the years? Soccer games, basketball games. He's, oh, well. <laughs> he's, he's got. <laughs> I'd like to see some of those. <laughs> he's got. He's got things. In my no uh, we still, did. We did hockey games at Scott's Rink in Shazy when it was about ten below inside that rink. Oh, still filming away. 
No wind chill. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no wind chill. <laughs> Listen, I had five kids playing hockey at one time back in the day. <laughs> and most of those hockey arenas were not inside but outside. The ones that were inside had no walls, just a roof yep, over the yep. top so you wouldn't get <laughs> snowed on. So, yeah, we've had some frostbite. <laughs> and we learned to huddle around the cold and the wood stoves. Oh, it's, and been, it's, it's all been wonderful. You know, i got to thank both of you. Well, thank sincerely you. for not only for allowing Cal Calvin and I to come here today to put some of the nuts and bolts together to see how you did this but for your uh, wonderful dedication to your jobs and to this community and the two go hand in hand can you imagine just coming into this area let's say you moved here on June 5th of night mm -hmm. of 20 15, wow. 2015, Boy, you and surprise. somebody, some editor named Lois said, uh, can you go to Denamora? Denamora? Is that D-E-N-N-A-M? <laughs> Thank you both for your wonderful dedication and what, and what you do. At the end of the day, I'll give you a thumbs up and you can you can do that for yourselves. Hey, all the journalists in this area, you, Calvin, the, everybody who tries to chronicle the history here. It's very important that we have this, that we have a record of what happened and that, you know, th this, these- In this ways is, you don't find in, 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 in uh, areas this size around the country. No. It's because of special people like, like you People all. will be telling this story to their kids years from now and, and right. little kids will be talking about remembering to go to school when there were police officers there because of the, these two escaped murderers. And, and you know, it's nice to have something to to show people what it was. So tonight, when you put your kids to bed, instead of grabbing, you know, Snow White in the <laughs> in the twelve <laughs> misfitted <laughs> dwarfs, get a copy of Prison Break and say, "I remember." <laughs> oh, June. Like I said, my daughter will never forget her graduation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, how could you? Because of that, another significant and, event. Um, yeah. She was. Fortunately, she was salutatorian, so she, she got did. to make a speech. And she talked about she Joe. she mentioned <laughs> Oh, did she really? She, she talked about how Joe had spent so much time, but had he was such a good dad that he was there on the day. That was when Richard Matt was shot, yes, right? Yes, the day well, he was oh at graduation. Goodness. You so, didn't record the speech? So no, the, no, we oh, did. You got, <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got an ovation. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> really. Which, <laughs> that was really sweet of her to do that. Man. Yeah. I was I very that's, proud, obviously. That's really, really wonderful. Yeah, that's uh, that's a whole other television program. Yeah. How do our kids react to all this stuff that we've done oh. through our adult lives yeah. in the area? Like you know? during the ice storm, uh, you know, we all worked when they all had school off, so they remember a big vacation, and we remember <laughs> an awful lot of hard yeah. work, you know? <laughs> and I believe that during the ice storm that Kelvin has at least 28 million feet of film that's never been on, not, it's all never been on TV, has it? Well, I've got a bunch that's been on, but <laughs> one time or never all together. <laughs> but, and I, I've got a lot that people well, have given me of their own personal home movies that I've never. Uh, yeah, never I wasn't on. even on the radio in those days. So what was I doing with my little camcorder, riding around for no r reason except to save it for myself? Look at this! Look at this! Don't hit that tree! Look out! Yeah. Well, we've been through a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Rich, rich life. Right. And. and None of this story that we've told today is fabricated. This is all true, absolutely true. Uh, I always thank our viewers for Hometown Cable and Our Little Corner for their comments for this television show. Calvin and I have done an average of one a week for almost 19 years, if you think about that. Not, not to mention how many columns I've written for the Press Republic and, and other newspapers and magazines in the area. But, but it's been great to become part of this community. And, and I'm one of those people who can't keep a secret. So I was born, my mother said, with my mouth going just like this. So <laughs> there was a, as part of our destiny. But thanks for all your comments and suggestions. Thanks especially to Joe and Lois for inviting us here at the Press Republican today in March of uh, 2016. Thank you for watching. And especially thank those people who have the wherewithal to take out their pocketbook and write a generous check or take a $50 bill out of there and put it in an envelope and send it to Kelvin Castine and Care of Hometown Cable. 1477 Ridge Road in Champlain. It's the only way we have of keeping this program on the air for a long time to come. And who knows where we're going to be next time.
for our little corner.